Good evening, everyone. Excuse me, I have some business to attend to. Um, let me just get this. Uh, it's the, uh, before anyone asks, it's the Carlsberg export this evening. Pint cans, no less. So, um, let's see if I can pour this without making it look like um, someone's let off a fire extinguisher. Uh, let's see if I can get a reasonable head on it. And then I'll take a look at the chat and see who we got in and what's been going on anyway. But, oh, there we go. Not too bad. First pour of the day. We'll, we'll get better with practice. <laughs> Cheers, everyone. Ah. Oh. Anyway, let's see who we got in. Um Scroll up the chat. We've got Aussie, we've got Ian, we've got David Evans, we've got Truman, we've got Dave Lewis, S. Wayne's got Johnny Random, Chris Ottawell, uh, Derek Clacton, Robert Bryant. How are you, Robert? Nice of you to join us live. I know you usually watch on uh, on the on the kind of catch up on the repeat, you know. Uh, but uh, nice to see you in here. Uh, I don't know if it's too early for a beer with you, but hopefully you can join in at some point. Um, <clears throat> evening, Colin. Uh, Colin Falcons in, and uh, who else? Michael Dodds. How are you, Michael? Uh, Brexit Central and Sarge's in as well. So quite a lot of familiar uh, faces and names. Ian Clark. How are you, Ian? Um, yes, the, the usual suspects, Colin. Us, uh, us happy crew. What's that? You know that the band of brothers and all that from what was it um, from Henry the something the Shakespeare thing? Um, I used to know that I did it at school, but it escapes me. It's been a long time since then. Um, my dad's three year memory today, so having a drink f uh, for him today. Well, that's let's all raise a glass to him, uh, Jason. So yes, indeed. Um, So, evening, Chip. How are you? Um, Peter Shields, he's in Axe Caricaturist, a uh, very talented chap. Um, he does all of the, well, I'm sure you know, but that, that, that little caricature of me that's on all of my uh, videos these days, that is the man responsible. So, if you're looking for some artwork of that nature, just give me a shout. Uh, anyway. Uh, let me tell you what's coming up on the channel this week. Um, tomorrow, uh, do you remember I did that? I'm doing these uh, videos about like different chord sequences. Well, there's another one of those this week, but um, there's one of the chord sequences that sort of descending minor key thing that was a couple of weeks ago. Uh, someone asked, um, you know, a very, very pertinent question. It's like, that's fine. But how do you play over it? What do you play over it sort of scale-wise and solo-wise? So that's the video that's coming up tomorrow. Um, then um, Monday, well, let's just say it's one of my bucket list solos. I've been wanting to learn this solo um, for years, well, decades now since I first heard it. And there's always been something else to do. There's always been something that sort of got in the way of me sitting down and figuring it out. But on Monday, you're going to see probably the solo that's given me the most satisfaction in terms of learning and um, tabbing it out and everything. Um, so which one could that be? I'll give you a clue. It's not Gary Moore, uh, which is, um, you know, possibly a bit unusual for me. But uh, then Tuesday, uh, there is a little bit of a pentatonic kind of lesson video coming up, um, just basically about what I think is a, a simplified way of mapping out the neck uh, with your pentatonic shapes. Uh, Wednesday, we're looking at chord sequences again, and um, the, I may even be mentioning the dreaded M word during that video, modes, uh, we shall see. Uh, Thursday, I'm thinking of doing an album review of, um, well, you know, best new albums from old bands. That's that's sort of the, the thing I'm thinking of. Um, 
because it, you know, there are a lot of uh, you know kind of decades old bands. You know, I'm thinking ACDC, Deep Purple, and a few others who are still cranking out albums. And um, you know, I'm just going to kind of give you my opinion on some of those. So that's Thursday, and then Friday we're back on the beer again. Uh, so that's what you can uh, expect this week on the channel. Anybody, anybody got any ideas what Monday's solo might be? It's um, it's a player who I have immense respect for, given that he is um, you know quite the uh, the respected blues man, uh, but got a little bit more kind of going on than your average pentatonic blues player. So, uh, anybody got any guesses? No, it's not Eric. It's not Eric Johnny. Um, it's um, no, not Knopfler, not Knopfler, uh, not Clapton. Um, if I tell you, he um, he once played with Miles Davis. Robin Ford, Podrick, you got it, mate. Yes, indeed. Um, that's it. Uh, we are looking at an absolutely delicious solo for, by Robin Ford on Monday. Um, if you're familiar with the Talk to the Do Talk to Your Daughter album, you will know the track "Help the Poor." Well, that is the solo we are doing on Monday, and it's a good one. Um, it's it's deceptively easy. Y you think, oh, Robin Ford. Okay, it's got all of that sort of. Um, diminished the whole tone melodic minor stuff going on you could analyze it like that or you could just look at it as um being pentatonic with um some carefully and wisely chosen additional notes um so yes robin ford i think i think the cat's out the bag now everyone it's robin ford um robin fords as they do in south shields yes um Anyone use a floor modeler, uh, a la Helix, etc.? Uh, well, I, I haven't, but I'm sure somebody out there will have done. Um, I suppose you could say my old tone lab was was kind of the bottom rung on the ladder of that uh, of that style of kit. But um, okay, I have a request for a solo. You recently mentioned the Hal Linda solo and Two Young Lovers on Alchemy Live. Been trying to figure it out and reckon I could do. Do it with the hand if you can. Okay, James. Right. Okay, you've just chosen next week's solo. Let me uh, just write that down. Right. That is the solo that's going on. Um, not this Monday coming, but the, the Monday after that. Um, I'd love you to do a video of the Mick Ronson guitar solo in Ian Hunter's Once Bitten Twice Shy. We can, I'm sure we can do that. Um, let me just put that down on the list as well. Um, once Bitten. Okay. Yeah, it's on the list, mate. Um, uh I'm an exiled South Shields lad. Which venues, if any, have you played there? Uh, the one that springs to mind that I've played many, many times is South Shields Labour Club. Played that many times. I don't even know if it's still there. I don't know uh, what it is, but it's. I seem to remember it was like, um, you know, at the top of a hill and, um, you know, the concert room upstairs and, um, you know, played there a few times with a few different bands. Uh, had good nights, had not so good nights, depending upon the crowd and depending on the band band I was in. Uh, can you do drop off arpeggios, John? Um, possibly, we'll we'll see. <laughs> um, uh, the Cleden Club? No, I don't think I've played there. Um, Speaking of Robins, are you doing the Great Garden Bird Watch tomorrow? Uh, that would be rather difficult for me uh, because we don't have a garden. <laughs> um, we ju we just have a backyard that's full of bins and half it's taken up by a shed, and then there's a an old rusty barbecue in there, and uh, and then that that's pretty much it really. So we don't have a garden. Uh, 
I ordered a Harley Benton Strat last night, seeing so many good reviews about them uh, for their price, planning on using it as a project guitar to do some mods on. Yeah, they're an excellent platform. I've often, I've, I keep thinking about actually doing like a kit build guitar. Um, but the thing is, you know, when you buy one of these kits that's maybe say somewhere about 100, 250 quid, you know, you, you know you're going to have to junk the pickups and the tuners and the bridge and everything and, and buy those again. And by the time you've done all of that, it's and probably, you know, kind of sorted out, you know, recutting the nut and stuff like that. You might as well just buy the, uh, like a cheap Harley Benton and mod that. It's, um, no yard birds. <laughs> no. Uh, all we get around here are seagulls and they're best avoided because, uh, they tend to, they tend to act like, um, you know, bomber command. You know, it's more than once I've uh, I've felt that kind of um, that warm splatter on the back of my head. Um, you know, uh, it's just oh my god, here we go. You know, it's I don't know whether I attract them or or whatever, but uh, it's happened more than once. Um, flying rats, basically. Yeah. Um, John, were the big Bailey's club still going when you were playing live? Uh, not to me knowledge. I mean, there might have been, but that's um, that's not a term I'm familiar with. Um, I haven't really done a lot of uh, live work since about the early 2000s. Evening, Craig. How are you, mate? Oh, dear me, that first one's always the best one, isn't it? Excuse me while I just top up the tanks. Oh, yes, I meant to tell you this, actually. Um, I'm thinking about doing this live stream in a slightly different format. Um, you know, just kind of keeping things fresh. Um, it's still going to be at 5 p.m. on a Friday, and it's still going to involve chat and beer, and it's still going to be on YouTube. Um but I'm thinking about maybe doing it more like a Zoom call or something. Um, you know, because I use this uh, this really cool video conferencing thing called Jitsi, uh, which is like Zoom, but it's better and it's free. Um, and I've noticed a few other YouTubers are starting to do their live streams using this. And it, it, it basically means that you can not just chat to me, uh, through the chat, but, you know, we can have, like, you know, we can have conversations face-to-face. -face. Um, I'm not entirely sure of the logistics of it the, at the moment. So I am thinking about, you know, just kind of looking into doing it, seeing what the technical requirements are and and all of that sort of stuff. Um, so let me know. Is that something you'd be interested in? Um, it was suggested, um, you know, a guitar performance live stream. Um, yeah, the difficulty then is actually getting the kind of hooking everything up so that the, uh, the sound is of, of decent quality. Um, I'm sure there's a way of doing it, but, um, it's a case of how do I do it so that it's, you know, accessible to a, a 54 year old technophobe dinosaur like me work for, for not very much money. Um. Yeah, are you okay? It seems like I'm getting positive, um, a positive kind of uh, response to that. Uh, a, a drinking competition. We could always do a yard of ale, couldn't we? <laughs> John, do a phone in. Yes, yes. Um, <laughs> then, uh, uh, well, I used to do a phone in on the radio, actually, when I, when I was on a tiny little minuscule radio show, radio station around here. We used to have the odd phone in, and uh, I was involved in those. I really enjoyed your guitar collection video. Any other guitar, any other guitars you regret parting with besides the Gordon Smith? Um, yeah, a couple, actually. Um more kind of seasoned viewers of this channel will remember the um, the Harley Benton Cabronita style Telecaster, uh, you know, with the two sort of Filtertron style pickups. I really, really loved that guitar, um, but it had to go. Um, we have a dog, as you know, you've seen him in a couple in the uh, the town uh, the tour of Red Car video. 
and uh, he's insured. You know, we've got insurance on him for his vet's bills and stuff. Uh, but there was um, basically a, a massive excess to pay on uh, some of his treatment when he came down with pancreatitis because there was like x-rays and scans and you know all all manner of stuff that he had to have done and um you know there was a there was a several several hundred pounds of excess to pay i mean the actual vet's bill itself was kind of well into you know kind of the thousands um and um you know i had to pay like a, a big chunk of that to get the insurance claim rolling so I had to sell the, um, the a couple of guitars, the uh, the the black Harley Benton semi acoustic that I had, and the Cabernita Telecaster uh, Harley Benton thing. So I regret getting rid of that one, especially. Uh, what else? Uh, difficult to say, really. Um, I suppose the first proper like really kind of big name guitar that I got was in 1989. Uh, and that was a Fender heavy metal Stratocaster, one of the original ones. And once I'd got over the, um, the novelty factor of I've suddenly kind of joined the big boys club, you know, I'm, I'm not playing on Hondos or, you know, Marlin Sidewinders or, you know, those kind of budget brands from the eighties. I'm not playing that. I've got, I've got like a, Fender, real Fender. Once I got past that, I realised it really wasn't me as a guitar. Um, you know, I didn't. It was my first experience with locking trims. It was not a good one, and I've not had a good one since. Um, and it just wasn't really me as a guitar. But I regret selling it because those things are worth an absolute king's ransom now. If you've got a decent. Um, you know, if you've got a decent quality late 80s Fender Heavy Metal Strat, they they fetch good prices, you know. I mean, they've just reissued them, I think, was it last year or the year before? Um, you know, and the new ones are, you know, well into four figures, and the, the, the originals from the 80s are just different enough to be collector's items. Uh, so I regret, I regret, excuse me, I regret getting rid of that one. Um John, your new guitar number should be one. Um, yeah, well, I, I don't know if you're kind of referring to, to, to this beast here. Uh, look at that top. Isn't that gorgeous? Um, I just, I mean, yes. I mean, obviously, that's my signature guitar. And um, Scott Guitars and myself have, you know, a relationship that involves me kind of uh, publicizing that guitar, which is why I play it in all of the videos. But even if I didn't have that relationship, even if that was just like a, you know, a, um, a, a, a custom built guitar that I'd had made, it would still be the guitar that I used all the time because I'm going to be doing, that's another video that's coming up, maybe not next week, but possibly the week after I've been living with that guitar for a while now. And I'm, you know, it's kind of, um, you know, getting to know that the sort of nooks and crannies and the ins and outs of it. And, um, there's nothing it can't do really. Uh, there's nothing I can't get out of it. It'll do Telecaster sounds. It'll do Les Paul sounds. It'll, do um you know kind of almost like a piezo acoustic sort of sound if you kind of get the tone control and the outer phase thing in the in the right way it's just so versatile and so simple to dial in and it plays like a hot knife through butter it is a beautiful beautiful instrument um you know dan i don't know if you're in at the moment because I've, I've missed a lot of the chat because i've been blethering but if you know you've made you've made a really rather superb guitar there um the prototype of that one um is uh, currently uh in the hands of mike from china guitar skeptic who's i think fallen absolutely head over heels in love with it um uh, yeah we need a swiss army guitar one size fits all well look, th this is the thing you see i mean bef you know once upon a time, I was always on eBay or Anderton's or GAC 
um, or wherever, looking, thinking, oh, I really fancy one of those. Oh, I really like one of those. You know, but you get to a point, certainly I have, where you know your own style of playing and you know what you need and you know how you like your guitar to kind of behave. And you just have this list of things that, that you want in a guitar and then that's, that's you know, it. Um, it's much like, um, did you see the um, the unveiling of the Josh Smith signature Ibanez? Now, that guitar isn't... I love Telecasters, and it's basically a Telecaster, but it wouldn't be my choice of Telecaster. Um, you know, it's... I don't like the 21 fret neck and a few other things, but the, the point I'm making is when Josh was talking about it, he was just saying that like you know he's been playing long enough and he knows what he likes in a guitar and this was the first time he'd ever got everything just dialed in perfectly the way he wanted it and and that's that guitar for me um you know it's i've got the power of humbuckers i've got the kind of transparency of single coils i've got that peter green tone it's just a marvelous guitar sorry I'm, I'm i'm blethering on about that guitar a bit too much aren't i um Um, what's your last guitar the one you haven't got um, I'll be honest I mean I am at the moment I am sort of tempted by a Les Paul um, I'm just I don't know. Not not a Gibson Les Paul. I'm just tempted by one of these um, these Ibanez. Not Ibanez. Where have we got Ibanez from? We're talking about Josh Smith's guitar, Epiphone. Um, these new Epiphone um, inspired by Gibson Les Pauls. I just think they look really, really gorgeous. But the thing is, I've thought that with every Les Paul style guitar I've had over the years, and I get it, and I start playing. It, I think, oh yes. This is why I don't like Les Pauls, you know. Is it just the ergonomics of it and stuff? Um, I'm tempted by one of those, but I know it's just sort of guitar acquisition syndrome. Um, I, I know if I had it, I probably would play the bejesus out of it for two, three weeks, and then it would be ju just become one that's part of the backdrop behind me. Um, Yeah, the Bernie Les Pauls, uh, they're, they're absolutely fantastic. Um, I used to be in a band with a guy who had um, a Bernie Les Paul, and uh, he absolutely loved it. And he, what a tone he got out of it. He was plugged into, um, you know, one of those old HH amps with the, the, two, the 2B12 uh, combo, solid state combo, and a Les Paul copy. And he got the best tone out of it and um you know i i was always badgering him to, to, to sell me it but he wouldn't and the, the same guy actually had uh do you remember back in the 80s there was what was it was it the epiphone spotlight which was like an early uh prs copy um he had one of those in it and that was a lovely guitar the only thing about that guitar that i didn't like was it had a plastic fingerboard um, I think they called it uh, phenolic or something, or, you know, it was some kind of a, but some kind, they tried dressing it up in, in terms of like high tech carbon fiber infused, this, that, and the other. It was essentially a plastic fretboard. Um, and you just think, come on, lads, you know, just put a lump of wood on there. It might make the guitar cost five quid more, but, you know, it would have been a better guitar for the result. That was a beautiful guitar, but his Bernie Les Paul was absolutely beautiful. Yeah, I, I hear what you're saying, Phil. Uh, Les, uh, Les Pauls can be a little bit... It's like a Les Paul always wants to... If I just pick up this guitar, my signature guitar, did I mention that? If I pick up this, right, a Les Paul always wants to end up doing that. And if I pick up an SG, an SG always wants to end up doing that. And the other thing with SGs is because the neck join is is sort of so kind of far that way, 
you know, everything just seems to be like, you know, you, you feel like you're kind of reaching over here somewhere to play a, a, a C chord or something. Um, SG's, they're a guitar that I think you have to acclimatise to. And once you do, you know, um, good luck to you. But it's, it's for years of being a Strat and Telecaster player, you know, you pick up an SG and it just feels so different. It's it's suddenly like going going from wearing you know um, sandals to wearing hobnail boots. <laughs> yeah, Jimmy, I saw that uh, Daryl Braun review. Um, I do like the lad's videos. You know, he's um, he, he he's you know he gets some good stuff on his channel. You know, um, I like his build videos as well. Um, it's the thing with Les, me and Les Pauls. I always think they look beautiful, and I always—I mean, you look at my kind of um, my kind of top guitar players. I mean, Gary, you know, Mister Moore, uh, Eric when he was with the Blues Breakers and Cream and stuff, and you know, I mean, Jimmy Page, and you know, loads and loads of Peter Frampton, you know. Loads of my favourite guitar players use Les Pauls, get great tones out of them, and they are an iconic guitar, and Peter Green, there's another one. Um, and yet, every time I pick up a Les Paul, I always just think, okay, um, you know, this feels a bit odd, and the pickup selector's in the wrong place, and, you know, um, I have to kind of, this hand has to kind of find its way through the maze of uh, volume and tone controls down here. Um, and I suppose I could, you know, if that was my only guitar, I could, I could get used to it, but it's like, yeah, um, I, I'm too, probably too set in my ways. Um, uh, you get used to doing the strap slide thing between phrases. Good for making, making you shut up once in a while. <laughs> Yeah, SGs um, for low tunings. Yes, I, I, I'll I'll go along with that. You know, it's what off anything heavy, really, isn't it? I mean, can here's a challenge for you. Can you think of any guitarist who is known primarily for their clean sound, who uses an SG? Um, you know, it's um, it's a tricky one, that isn't it? Um, yeah, the fifty nine has got a, a, a pretty fat neck. Um, that said, my two favourite guitars, or two of my favourite guitars, are that one. Then I won't pick it up again. That's got like a, a fairly kind of fifties ish Les Paul style neck on it, and the uh, the Gordon Smith. You can't see it; uh, it's out of shot at the moment. That's uh, much more like a sixty, like an early sixties SG quite a slim neck and that's just something i have it's it's like once um once i've spent five minutes playing a guitar and i've acclimatized to the feel of the neck i'm okay with it i'm not one of these people that has to have this neck profile or that neck profile um you know it, it's as long as it's comfortable basically um you know lowish action no fret buzz no fret sprout um, beyond that, as long as it's not like a, a skinny kind of Ibanez wizard, uh, shreddy kind of 80s neck profile, and I'm, I'm pretty much okay with it. Yeah, I suppose you're right, mate. Frank Zappa's uh, tone wasn't too distorted. Um, but, he, you know, it's... I guess you're right. Yeah, Frank Zappa. <laughs> John, the HB Custom Series Les Pauls are a bit uh, thin and should stay level. Yep, yep. Um, th there is that, but there's also just, I mean, I don't know. It's its that Les Paul thing of um, the controls are in the wrong place if you're a habitual Fender player. Uh, that's one of the things, anyway. Um Oh, you got the Harley Benton Fusion T. Amazing spec for the price. Plays, feels, and sounds fantastic. Yeah, I had the uh, one of the first Harley Benton Fusion S-type guitars. Uh, well, I had two. Um, I bought one for the charity and um, then sold that on, obviously, to raise money for the charity, and then bought one for myself. And um, the thing was, 
I wish I'd kept the one that I bought for the charity and then just bought another one for the charity because the one that I let go was the better of the two of the, the better of the two guitars. Um, the stainless steel frets sort of, they were, it was the first time really I'd ever had any guitar that I played for an extended period with, with stainless steel frets. And I was absolutely gobsmacked by the difference that those make. But then I got the, um, the, the, well, the, the, the Telecaster, the, uh, the Fender Deluxe Nashville Telecaster. And that just, the, the frets on that aren't stainless steel, but they had that same kind of slinky feel to them. Um, so, um, you know, maybe, I don't know, maybe it was just a better fret job on that Harley Benton, uh, and, and, and the stainless steel thing was by the by. Um, the thing that makes me st nervous about stainless steel frets is that, um, you know, if they do need work, it takes a lot more work to get them sorted. Um, you know, so it's because it's obviously it's a harder metal. Um, Craig saying, I have an ESP Viper there, SG, and it's starting to get uh, the dre dreaded crack at the base of the neck. Yeah, and that, that was another Daryl Braun video that he did a while ago, wasn't it? Well, he said he was absolutely done with Gibson because you know, um, you know, there were just cracks appearing all over it. You know, and he's saying it's only a crack in the finish, but a crack in the finish tends to mean that the wood is is sort of moving in places where it shouldn't be moving, and how long before that crack in the finish becomes a crack in the in the wood? Um, is it? Not just worth buying a new neck instead of a refret. Well, that was Leo's intention in the first place, wasn't it? You know, with, with Fender, you know, bolt the neck on and then, you know, it's a modular design. You can just uh, bolt on a new neck rather than a refret. Um, but then, you know, us guitarists, we are, we are sentimental in that way, aren't we? If we get a neck, get a neck that we like and it all feels all worn in and the the fretboard edges are rounded off nicely and, you know, and it just feels like an old friend, you know, do, do, do we really want to be changing that sort of uh, player interface? You know, um, you know, that, that's why, you know, people uh, do refret guitars, I suppose. Um, Why are Les Paul so heavy? Can't see a reason why they should be. Well, it's because um, they're made out of wood these days that still has a lot of moisture in it, which is why they have to kind of route out big canyons in the body. You know, they call it weight relief, don't they? Um, you know, I can't remember who it was I was watching, but there was a, a YouTube guy I was watching uh, who was saying that... Um, Back in the 50s, um, Les Pauls were made with wood that had been kind of sat, you know, kind of, you know, in warehouses and storerooms for decades already kind of drying out. And, you know, they were building guitars with that stuff. But then the, the electric guitar boom took off, I guess, you know, in the 60s with the Beatles. And everybody and demand for electric guitars went up, so they had to start using you know they, they, they used up all that stock of old wood and they had to start using newer wood which wasn't as dried out. Um, and that's why Les Pauls are so heavy because they're made from wood which is, um, you know, not at the moment, uh, you know, decades old and seasoned and dried out and, you know, stable, which I guess goes into the whole kind of uh, cracks in the finish kind of thing as well. Uh, one bedroom flat means uh, no room to acquire too much. Yes, well, this is only a two up, two down house. Um, I, I that's another consideration for me, kind of getting new guitars. It's like, where am I going to put them? Uh, that said, that said, 
the wife's just bought herself a new pair of shoes this week, so I'm, I've kind of logged that one and thought, you know, okay, new shoes, is it? <laughs> I'll, um, I'll, 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 I'll remember that when, you, when you're telling me about how many guitars do I really need. Yeah, the early Gibsons used furniture stockwood. Um, yes, that was that. You must have seen the same video as me, Johnny, because that was the, the the same thing in that video. I'm st I'm struggling to think who it was who it was uh, that I saw. Um, um, when I worked in Lloyd's of London, there was an insurance claim for a huge warehouse of Gibsons that burned down. It was full of necks that had been seasoning for years. Okay, that's interesting. Like an inside of view from from the insurance industry, that's um, you know. Uh, did did the insurance pay out, Malcolm? That's the that's the, uh, the the important question, isn't it? Brian May's guitar body was old wood too. Apparently, that guitar is is it, that the, the the famous red special is. Um, Mainly hollow. I seem to remember seeing. Um, I think it was on that Premier Guitar Rig Rundown series of videos when he was talking about the guitar. Um, you know, it's um, the main. There's like a main sort of central kind of uh, lump of mahogany that was an old fireplace or something, and um, then the rest of it is just you know kind of you know rubbish as he called it you know just kind of cheap filler wood um you know just to kind of pad it out but there's there's certainly um cavities in there don't forget the money she spends on shampoo yes um <laughs> indeed uh yeah it's um mind you she's she's managed to rein that in um she she gets uh she's she's don't ask me the brand because I don't take notice of such things. But she's managed to find some supermarket brand that she says, hey, this is really good. Oh, no, great. Okay. Um, is it really necessary to install hot rails on a telly or just get a really, to get a really dirty growl? Um, yeah, sort of. Um, I've had a Telecaster with hot rails, with the hot rails in the bridge, a good hot rail style pickup to put in the bridge of a Telecaster and it's cheap as chips is the, uh, the one that you can find on eBay. Just search for Artec Telecaster hot rails. Uh, great little pickup and it cut that about 20 quid cheap as chips. Um, and the main reason I put one of those into the, the, uh, the beer o'clock Telecaster that you can see behind me, uh, was because I was um, just to kind of as an insurance policy really against the the, the noise factor. Uh, that said, in there at the moment there is an Iron Gear Steel Twin pickup, uh, which is a single coil, uh, and it's got an extra coil in there, so it doesn't become a humbucker. What it what actually happens is you just kick in the extra coil, and it just boosts the output. So like. Um, you know, it's, I've got it on a on a push push pot on the tone control, and uh, so w before it's activated, it's just like a regular Telecaster pickup. It'll do all of the kind of you know polite but raucous Telecaster bridge pickup sounds, and then you kick that boost in, and suddenly it's like a fire breathing monster. Uh, brilliant. I saw a video which said the reason for the Les Paul full thickness top is for the sake of tone. I don't think anybody has ever heard the tone wood like that on electric solid bodies. Uh, well, that whole tone wood debate, I mean, I got into a bit of trouble because um, I made a video about that a couple of years ago. Um, yeah, I mean... I think that the timber that a guitar is made from has an effect on the tone, but I don't think it's as specific or as dramatic as many people say. I don't think it has no effect, but I don't think it has a dramatic effect. And as a, as a, as a way of kind of demonstrating that, think of if you took the pickups and the bridge and 
you know, the tailpiece and uh, the strings and the nut even off a Les Paul and put it on a 335, would that 335 then sound like a Les Paul? Well, no, it would still sound like a 335. So the fact that one guitar is made of mahogany and maple and the other guitar is made of mahogany maple plus fresh air uh, indicates that the, 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 the amount of wood and the density of the wood is having some effect on the tone. Beyond that, um, I don't know. I, I don't really think that it's... I, I don't think you can say mahogany sounds like this and maple sounds like that and ash sounds like this. I think it's all to do with the, 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 the density of the grain in the wood and, you know, the amount of moisture in the wood. Um, I remember back in the 90s, Washburn did this range of super strats, and I've talked about this before. Um, they, they were like kind of HSS style guitars and you could buy one with, you could buy it with like a, an ash body, a mahogany body. Or I think it was Paduke was the other, the other wood that was available. And they discontinued them pretty quickly because, you know, there was, there was very little difference in tone between them. Um, so it was just seen as, okay, you know, it doesn't matter which, which, which wood you have. It's not making a lot of difference. Um, Your relaxed approach cured my intonation obsession, John. Oh, well, I'm glad to hear that, mate. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't like a guitar that's badly intonated, but it's like um, the people who kind of measure their intonation with a, like a, like with a surgical precision, you know, strobe tuner and everything like that, you know, and then you start playing and you add vibrato to every note. Okay. You know, it's um, and by by virtue of the way you add vibrato on an electric guitar is you're bending the note sharp, you know. Um, so it's that 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 sort of makes a mockery of, of of having the intonation, you know, kind of dialed in to like you know, not one point one percent of a semitone. Um, you know, if you're just going to kind of throw a load of vibrato on every note that you play, um, you know, it's. Yeah, it's. I mean, when a guitar is badly intonated, it, it does bother me. Um, but and that's usually the first sign for me when the strings need changing. When I get up to like the the tenth, eleventh fret, and things start sounding a little bit Les Dawson, then um, that's when I think, okay, time to change strings, John. You know. Um, where are we? Weren't some of the early tellies bodies made of pine? They were indeed, and I don't know if they still are, but I do know that uh, certainly some of the classic vibe 50s tellies, excuse me, itchy leg, um, were made of, had pine bodies. Um, nothing wrong with pine for, for that style of guitar. I mean, I, I remember years ago I did a review, you can probably hunt it down, of a um, Harley Benton, funnily enough, um, you know, kind of gold top style Les Paul, and that had a basswood body, and it was the most Les Paul sounding guitar, you know, that you could ever want to play. It it sounded like it was made of, you know, really old mahogany, but it was just it was basswood. What was the brand of strings that you said were a good deal, John? They are, hang on, let me hold them up to the camera. I have no affiliation with this brand, uh, but I use them on all my guitars. Legacy, there you go. Um, 10 to 46 gauge, they go on all my guitars, and these are about three ninety nine a set from Strings R Us. Uh, Strings R Us. Um, what's the, what's the company? Strings Direct, that's the company. Um, <laughs> a little bit Les Dawson, yes. Uh, no, nobody who um, was born, you know, kind of after the 1990s or outside the UK will know Les Dawson. I'd better explain. He was a British comedian and his whole shtick, or one of his things, was that he used to play brilliantly out-of-tune piano. Um, he knew exactly which was the, 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 the funniest note to get wrong. Check him out on YouTube. <clears throat> so 
Saw a video of a, uh, a builder who put, put Tully hardware on a fence board and it sounded pretty good. Kind of fixed my obsession with tone wood. Yeah, I'll tell you a great guitar I used to have. Um, it was back in the days when I was kind of the, a Strataholic. It was one of those uh, late 80s or early 90s, roughly just before Yamaha started bringing out the Pacificas. It was a late 80s or early 90s uh, Squire Strat that had a plywood body. And I put a set of EMG pickups in that and got an immense sound out of it. Um, you know, but then again, as Pat Travers said, you could put, you could put EMGs on a shovel and get a great tone. Um, but yeah, fantastic guitar. Beautiful slinky low action. Um, typical sort of 80s squire, you know, maple neck that with that, that, that really kind of thick, kind of glossy lacquer on it. Um, you know, but it was still, it was a lovely guitar. It, it was an absolute double for a Clapton Blackie sort of strap, which is the reason I got it. And as I say, I didn't know it was plywood. It was just like, it was the guitar I got right before I got that heavy metal strap I was talking about earlier. And that was like my first rung on the ladder. Oh, it's a Squire. It's almost a Fender. You know, I didn't know it was had a plywood body. Um, and as I say, the, 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 the kind of original pickups were a little bit shrill sounding. So, um, I put some EMGs in it. Great guitar. Used it for loads of gigs. Recorded with it, and it you know, it was great. Um, plywood body. What more can I tell you? Yeah, uh, Harley Benton strings, Daniel. Um, yeah, I've used those. The only thing I would say against Harley Benton strings is they sound great when you first put them on. Um, but they do, my experience of them, and maybe it's just my body chemistry, me sweat and everything, but they did seem to kind of go dull quicker than those legacy strings. Um, you know, you, you know, when you play that sort of open bottom E, and that's another thing that I always kind of listen for with a set of strings. I'm, I'm always looking for that sort of deep resonant, kind of bottom end of a grand piano kind of timbre from the um, from a low E string. And they had that in spades when I first put them on, but then it just started to go a little bit thunk, you know, where the, the, it just didn't have that kind of ringing resonance. Um, but, yeah, I mean, if you at a push, like if I was, when I used to be gigging regularly, I used to change strings every night which became sort of quite an, uh, you know, an expensive way of doing it, especially when you're buying Daddario's. Um, so back then, you know, if I was going to be changing the strings the next day, then it would be like, okay, just chuck a set of those on, do a gig with them, and then, you know, bung another set on because they're, they're cheap enough that you can do that. Speaking of underrated secret guitarist, Sasha Distel. I didn't know he played guitar. Um, the, the the famous French balladeer. Yes, I remember him well. Um, my my abiding memory of Sasha Distel was watching an episode of The Muppet Show where he was seducing Miss Piggy. Um, but there you go. He was always on the telly in the 70s. Him and Richard Clayderman, you know, the piano player. Um, anybody else remember him? I would love to find the same pickups as my, as my Yamaha SG to put into a new build. Can't find them everywhere. Yeah, Das. Um, that was that that was the thing with Yamaha SGs, wasn't it? You know, I remember. Um, you know, plenty of people back back in the day used to kind of. Uh, oh, you got to have Dimaggio Super Distortion. I remember. Um, you know, plenty of people back back in the day used to kind of. Uh, oh, you got to have Dimaggio Super Distortion. You got to put Dimaggios in. And it was just like the default thing you used to do to a guitar, mainly because Ace Frehley used Dimaggio Super Distortions. And quite a lot of people, I seem to recall, you know, you would kind of put the Dimaggios into the, their SG and the Yamaha SG. And then it was like, okay, well, let's go back to the original stock pickups. They were great pickups. Um, 
Hi, John. Any advice for players with smaller hands? Um, well, um, yeah. J just, I mean, practice. Well, that's, it seems it seems a bit like kind of odd to say just, or you know, glib to say practice. But you know, um, I've got a young lad who I teach. Um, you know, he's. I think he's just turned eleven, and um, you know he can really rip up the neck, you know, do all the big stretches and stuff like that. It's not about, um, you know, the size of your hands or fingers or anything like that. It's, it's about a lot of the time being able to get those big stretches is about what your thumb's doing around the back of the neck. And that's the advice I gave to him. And, you know, just kind of rethink where your thumb is and that can really affect how far you can stretch and how far you can, you know, you, you can reach with your fingers. Um, don't put obstacles in your way. Don't buy a guitar with like, you know, a neck like a telegraph pole, you know, the Jeff Beck Strat spring, springs to mind um, or the Richie Cotts and Telecaster. Um, you know, don't you know, get a guitar where it's it's actually going to give you a fighting chance. But then it's it's all about, as I say, what your thumb's doing around the back, really, that affects how far these things can reach around the front of the neck. Um, uh, uh, you said ukulele. Wash your mouth out, ukulele. Um, what's the difference between an onion and a ukulele? Nobody cries when you chop up a ukulele. Anyway, chaps, I need another beer. Last one tonight. I'm on my paint cans tonight, so it's that's why it's taken me a little bit longer. Um, yes, Capo, <laughs> it's not the size, but how you do it. That's um, that should have been in a, in a Carry On film, shouldn't it? Um, Excuse me while I just replenish the tanks. And uh, no one's asked yet what, what dinner is tonight. Maybe they have, but I haven't seen it in the chat. Um, it's curry tonight. Not homemade curry. Not not some microwave thing. No, we, we've got a we've got a delivery turning up at seven o'clock. Um, in, in all seriousness, you know, I mean. Bengal spice. You saw the uh, the clip of the place in the in the in the red car tour video a um, couple of weeks ago. Um, you know, it's a great little local business, and every now and again, I think it just behoves you if you want the business to be there when when normality has re returned. Then I think it's you know it's it's beholden upon you to or beholden upon me anyway to to support them during the the, the tricky times. So. That's my excuse, and I'm sticking to it. We're having a, we're having a a, a takeaway curry tonight, and um, you know, really looking forward to it. It's starting to get a bit peckish now. It has to be said. Um, Paul McCartney loves ukulele. Well, fair enough. Seven o'clock curry extended live stream. Then John, no, no, I've. The, 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 usually what happens is um, after the live stream, um, usually nip downstairs just kind of six o'clock-ish, and it usually coincides with um, an episode of one of my favourite TV shows, Wheeler Dealers, uh, that comes on. I, I can't explain why I like that show, I just do. Um, and um, sit and watch an hour of Wheeler Dealers and uh, have a couple more B as well, I'm doing that. And then the curry turns up and then more beer. And then eventually it gets a bit blurry and I go to bed. And that's usually my Friday evening. <laughs> What's the difference between a banjo and an accordion? The accordion burns for longer. <laughs> yeah, I always try to use local shops, John. Uh, can't fault you. Um, that Indian restaurant looks great. It is, it is yeah. I mean, it's they've won like sort of all kinds of awards for um you know kind of their curry chef and what have you who, who's kind of won like big awards and stuff i think it's in in the in the whole sort of um 
restaurant business, I think there is um, a lot of snobbery towards, you know, kind of Indian restaurants especially, but, you know, other Italian restaurants as well. That's another one. Um, we used to have a, a fantastic Greek restaurant near us called Spiros. Um, really, I mean, like properly, properly nice food. But, you know, it's um, because it's not sort of... Um, you know, a, a portion that big that you pay 150 quid for, uh, then, you know, you, it, it's not Nouvelle Cuisine and it's not, you know, kind of, it's 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 not in the sort of Michelin sort of category that, um, you know, they don't get the recognition. Anyway, let's get off that. Let me get off that particular soapbox. Banjo is the business if you play that fast rolling bluegrass thing. Yeah. I mean, I'll I'll go along with that. It's um, the the thing about banjo is that um, when you hear a really good virtuoso banjo player, um, then that really does kind of tickle the right uh, the right muscles, doesn't it? But it's a bit like it's a bit like bagpipes. I love to hear uh, bagpipes being played well. Uh, one of my students, actually, um, Rockin' Tom, the sweary vicar. Um, I've told you about him before. He's um, uh, he doesn't mind me calling him Rockin' Tom, the sweary vicar. Um, he's 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 a vicar in the Church of England, and he is the most profane person I, I teach. You know, it's he's always effing and jeffing his way through the lessons. And, um, you know, he plays bagpipes as well as guitar. And, um, you know, he, he's played me a couple of pieces on bagpipes. And it's, you know, it's just that sort of haunting, mournful kind of uh, sound that it is. But you listen to somebody who's just trying to kind of, you know, a, a sort of grade one of the bagpipes. Like, it's painful. It's... Um, you know, it's just it's not a pleasant sound it's, it's and banjo for me is a bit like that once you get the kind of a, a virtuoso level it's it's a beautiful sound but before then yeah not so much um how do you get such a good head on your beer mine is always flat look at the draw mate um you know, I used to be a barman. I've worked behind the bar many times in me uh, in me career because that's just the nature of being a musician. You have good years and you have bad years, and sometimes you have to kind of supplement your income. Um, but um, you know, it's it is easy to pour a decent pint from a from a pump. It has to be said uh, from a from a can. It's it's never quite as easy, and there's a fair amount of luck involved. Um, um, Dueling Banjos, great tune, great movie, Deliverance. Um, John, isn't a lot of folk music just pentatonic? Yes, indeed it is. Um, John, isn't a lot of folk music just pentatonic? Yes, indeed it is. Um, that is why, um, you know, rock and roll happened, really, because Celtic folk music... Scottish and Irish folk music crossed the Atlantic um, and kind of ended up meeting with, uh, you know, sub-Saharan African music, uh, which is also very pentatonic. And um, because they shared a common DNA, boom, you had blues meets rock and roll meets country and you had rock and roll. ACDC, it's a long way at the top. Brilliant bagpipes. Yep. Um, how many other big rock songs can we think of that had bagpipes in them? Now, there's, a, there, there's a teaser for you. Um, the only other one I, I can think of at the moment, and I'm struggling to even call it a rock song, is uh, Mull of Kintyre. Um, Snapping a guitar, snapping a guitar string is okay. Snapping your banjo string is a different story. Okay, fair enough. Um, I've never snapped a banjo. The only time I've ever really played a banjo is that um, 
that sort of six string banjo guitar that I had in a while ago. Um, yes, Aussie, rock and roll is just a fad. It won't last. And you know, the people who said that were right. They were. Seriously. By 1960, Elvis was out of the army and making awful films. By 1960, Elvis was out of the army and making awful films. Chuck Berry was in disgrace. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Iron Man. Much, much appreciated. Thank you, mate. Cheers. Yeah, Big Country had a bagpipe sound. That was done with an Ebo, Brad. Um, um, the um, Yeah, where was I? Um, yeah, Elvis was kind of pretty much a, a, a B-movie star by the early 60s. Um, Chuck Berry in jail. Jerry Lee Lewis in disgrace. Uh, Little Richard had gone back to the church. Buddy Holly was dead. Richie Valens was dead. You know, and you had like Fabian and Pat Boone who were the rock, who were the rock and roll stars. And it, it just all got a bit sort of matinee idle and bland, hadn't it? And then along come the Beatles, and they looked like a rock and roll band. You know, they had longish hair for the day, and you know they played guitars and they had a drummer. And it was, you know, it was kind of it was marketed as a continuation of rock and roll. But you know, they were basically kind of doing the same chord sequences and you know, kind of melodic structures as Cole Porter and Irving Berlin. You know, kind of decades before. So that initial blast of rock and roll. It was just a fad, and then, you know, the, as I said, then the Beatles sort of reinvented that whole romantic songwriting tradition that had gone on, uh, you know, before rock and roll came along. So there you go. Anyway, yeah, but Carl Perkins, you know, he was, you know, yes, he wrote Blue Suede Shoes and, and what have you, but, you know, by the mid-60s, was he a big, you know, kind of, was he doing big box office? Probably not, really. Um, what do you reckon on Ebo's, John? Have you tried them? Um, briefly, I tried one at a guitar show many years ago, um, and um, it was it felt like a bit of a novelty then. But you know, it's it, you've been to guitar shows, I'm sure you know what the environment is there. You know, it's you, you don't really get to to, to feel of and, and test out the full potential of a product. I am looking at um, grabbing one actually and doing a review on it or something of that ilk because there are there are various other kind of knockoffs. Let's be frank about this of the e boat around. Um, so um, I will probably get around to doing one. Um, I shall reserve judgment, but you know, just the sounds that you can get on all, all that big country kind of bagpipe stuff. Uh, I know was done on on an Ebo because I read an interview with um, can't remember his name, but the guitar player in Big Country, and he said it was all just Ebo. Um, would you say the Beatles were pop, Stones were rock and roll? I don't think really in the mid six mid sixties that distinction really existed. Um, I don't think there was that sort of you know between pop and rock. I. I think you got to get to the late 60s, 67, 68, when bands started to think more about albums rather than just the next top 10 single. Uh, I don't think that distinction really existed. Um, you know, I mean, the Stones were a pop group uh, when you look at the, their early output, you know, stuff like, um, what was that first Chuck Berry cover did, that they did? Was it Come On? Um that, that was a, you know, just a, a charting hit single. It wasn't really until you got to, I guess, with the Beatles, you know, maybe Rubber Soul, um, you know, and then with the Beatles, you know, um, Satanic Majesty and all that sort of stuff that, that, that it started to become more of a of a distinction between the kind of bubblegum top 40 hit parade sort of stuff and, the you know, the, the stuff for the more mature listener. Uh, you use the Joyo version of the Ebo. It's easier for me to hold. Yeah, that's one of the ones I was thinking about. Actually, the the, the Joyo one. 
Uh, how can anyone not like something from the Beatles? Plenty of people do. Plenty of people do kind of have this. I mean, I just had a, a text message today from um, a lad who I teach. Um, and basically the way the lessons are going at the moment is I just do little... He, he's not into the whole Skype, Zoom sort of thing, so I do little kind of lesson packages and email them over to him. And he said, send me something with bar chords, not the Beatles, you know. Um, so I'm probably going to do a Foo Fighters song for him. Um, um, so that's, um, you know, the, the, the Beatles, you know, I mean, it's, it's without the Beatles, you wouldn't have had Queen you wouldn't have had Bowie. You wouldn't have had ELO. And, you know, probably I'm giving away my um, my kind of guilty secret here, but you wouldn't have had ABBA either. Um, you know, people rag on ABBA a lot, but, you know, they wrote some great songs and, um, you know, good melodies, clever chord sequences, good production. What's wrong with that? Um Anyway, chaps, we've been on over an hour and I'm starting to kind of get a little bit like uh, I need to go and insult the porcelain. Um, so once again, everyone, it never ceases to amaze me that, you know, a couple of hundred of you uh, turn up every Friday night to watch a fat lad talk rubbish and get, get a little bit drunk. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for all your support. Really, really appreciate it. But now I'm going to go and sit and wait for me curry. So thanks for turning up, everyone. Time, gentlemen, please. <laughs>